Thank you for your patience, everyone. Hope all that mumbo jumbo I just did doesn't show up on YouTube. Probably will. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. It's all yours, Sandra. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting, the Human Resources Admin and Public Relations Committee meeting to order. It is 9.05 a.m. Um, are there any additions or amendments to the agenda? Um, I have a, f a few, Sandra. Um, I'm just going to quickly under, um, under um, and under new business uh, after the COVID effects, I'm just going to quickly talk about Halloween, which uh, falls in line with COVID. Any noise? We can hear, Richard, hear we... you, Richard. No, I can can't. you not hear us? Can you hear us? Um, I'm going to add Halloween. Um, I'm just going to do a quick brief on the budget, which is also uh, COVID related. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the economic development intern, and then we have to set a meeting for the um, Algonquins of Ontario um, meeting that we talked about at the last meeting. So I don't, it, okay. you, could just, you could just loop that into a, a CAO brief at the end. That's fine. Okay. Go ahead. I'll try and remember. Okay, can I have um, someone to forward and someone to second adoption of the agenda, please? I do. That's Dave Harper and someone to second, please. Joey. Joey Sorry, Vermeer. Joey Vermeer to second. Thank you, Joe. Um, before we continue, does anybody want to disclose a pecuniary interest here? N noted. Okay, um, we have a delegation um, or presentation, as you'd like to call it, from. Oh, the I can't hear you. Sorry, Richard, we can hear you. Can you not hear me? I think Richard has a problem with sound somewhere along the line. Um, Richard, would you like to log out and try and log back in again? Okay, I think we need to uh, progress with this. We have our, our uh, guests here with our presentation from the Opiongo Snowbirds um, Association. And I know, and I'd like to thank you personally, Lucas, for stepping up to the plate here to take the presidency. Um, I know what's gone on in the past. We, my, my husband and I were very active um, with the Snowmobile Club a little while ago and, uh, and things have changed, I know. So over to you, please, for your presentation. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if my video went through there or not. It's fine. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to go over a few things to start. Um, obviously, the Snowmobile Club was in uh, dire need of new blood, and it almost dissolved as of September 7th, if I'm not mistaken. That was the date. And I stepped up to the plate to take it over. Uh, we have a bunch of new things going on this year that uh, I think we're pretty excited about and the snowmobile community is going to like a lot. I have a lot of help from uh, Chris, who I think some of you know personally. He's a great guy. He's our health and safety risk management coordinator. Uh, I'm not sure if he's able to speak right now. I'm here, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. 
<clears throat> oh, oh, sorry, Lucas, you wanted me to continue? Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, so I, I've stepped up to uh, volunteer and assist with uh, ensuring that the club's got some uh, solid health and safety programs in place. So they've got a lot of people out on the trails, a lot of people performing work. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that everybody stay safe. The trails are in good shape. So we're working on a, a fairly big program. They've asked me to bump up to the provincial level in addition to the region level. Uh, so I'm assisting them with a few things there. I'm, I'm not sure if the council knows, but uh, that is my career as well. I'm in health and safety as a professional. So um, we sent along a uh, document which uh, had a few points in it along with some aspects of snowmobiling. And I think uh, what Lucas and I want to present today is the value of having uh, good trails coming into the community and um, some repair that needs to be done uh, to the hill there in Whitney, as well as, uh, could, could we put the, Holly, is that is that document able to be put up? Uh, the, this, this one? No, there was a PDF attachment that I emailed you later. We never received uh, anything else, Chris. Carla. Um, okay, well, we'll continue without it. Um, I can send it now if it's possible to send it out to everybody. Yeah. But... Please do. And I'll just. Uh... Okay, just a moment. You can send it to clerk at South Algonquin, Chris. Let me know if you received it. Um, I don't know if you can carry on without it. Oh, just a minute. Sorry. I sent it to the deputy clerk. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Lucas can speak a little bit more about the history of the trail coming into Whitney. Uh, one of the reasons I thought it would be a good idea to have this uh, conversation is um, uh, we're trying to rebuild public relations with the various municipalities, the, the value that the Snowmobile Club obviously brings business into the region. Um, I'm relatively new to this club, so I, I have learned quite a bit in the last uh, couple of weeks about the quality of the trail that comes in and how a lot of uh, snowmobile sessions uh, or snowmobilers have uh, bypassed Whitney because of some quality of trails. We want to improve that. We want to make it so that it's a nice uh, trail all the way through. Uh, and there's some uh, resources allocations that we're hoping council can, can participate in or at least share some ideas on what could be of assistance to us and what we can be of assistance to you. And uh, I think Lucas, I'll let you tell the story from there. Uh, sure. So I just wanna make sure everyone can hear me again because my odd video is not going through for some reason. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So yeah, in the past, I'm aware that the trail system going into Whitney hasn't been in the greatest shape. And that had to do with, I guess, previous management of the club and organization of the grooming and another club that's supposed to meet with us there. And there was issues with that in the past. So we're working on that this year. We're going to have a groomer heading out three to four days a week out there um, in conjunction with another club coming out hopefully at least one day a week. So the trails will be in better shape hopefully this year than they've been in. Uh, we've been working with the Madawaska Town or Bears Bay Township and they graded from Wilno all the way down to past Spectacle Lake for us. So the B trail is nice and wide now, it's flat. Hopefully it's gonna be in better condition this year. 
And now we're trying to work on from Spectacle Lake all the way down to Whitney and get it in better condition. The Whitney Hill there is in uh, pretty bad shape from what I've been told. I've seen some pictures of it. I haven't been out there myself yet because of other snowmobile club stuff I've been dealing with. We had to assess a bridge and some other issues on our trail system and we're working our way down currently. But uh, we have a quote from Dexcon construction there, contracting, and it's going to be about $6,800 to fix the hill and the club's budget that eats up more than three quarters of it for a trail repair on just one hill. So we were wondering if there was any help that we could get from your end to help us out with that because it's in it's in your area and we understand that you know the snowmobile club um can do more if we have better trail systems out there and having that hill revamped will help our groomer get up it will help snowmobilers safely get up and down the hill because i know it's quite dangerous and with this new work that we're going to have done on it it's not going to wash out as much as it has been in the past, it's going to be safer for snowmobilers to get up and down it, and the trail system is going to be in better condition. So, Holly, could you just scroll down a bit, please, to show uh, there's a there's two pages in there which uh, everyone can look at later on. It just basically talks about the relationship between the snowmobile clubs and municipalities. Uh, but the second last page is the, the B trail that uh, Lucas is talking about. Um, just in case some of you may not be familiar with the route. Um, it's quite a long so, run. It's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so if you're looking at the map there, the B102 going to the E109, it got cut off there a little bit on your screen, but it goes up to the B trail. There's a T there and we have it uh, graded from there all the way to appro approximately the cross lake there. So that's a good section of it done. And now we're trying to work on getting it down all the way to Madawaska and into the beach, um, all the way down to Whitney. We've had a big bridge repair we did at the 155B intersection up at the top of our trail system where the yellow meets the red. Um, there's, there's lots of projects that we're working on and trying to make our trail system better. But as you can see, it's a lot of land to cover and we have a limited budget and we have a lot of motivated volunteers this year, but any help we can get from anyone works out better for the club. And I think Lucas, what you were telling me the other day is that section of the B trail largely to the left from Whitney running out um, in terms of the online map stays in the last, in the past years has stayed red or stayed uh, as low quality. And that's what yeah, we're looking to improve this year. For sure. And that's, that has partially to do with the trail not being graded, it being uneven because you can put as much snow down as you want, but once a snowmobile track starts turning where there's a big rut underneath all that snow, it's going to dig it up again. And then the trails get rocky, uncomfortable, and it just turns into moguls and flying down moguls for you know, roughly 50, 60 K to get to where it's going to be smooth. It uh, discourages riders from coming back to that area. And that's a big section of the wrap tour going around the B trail. Yeah, the wrap tour is one of the most famous tours that you can do on a snowmobile in Ontario. So we're trying to keep that in as good shape as we can to keep snowmobilers happy, more people coming around back into Whitney and helping the economy. So our, our ask of the group today is uh, two things. Uh, we're, we're looking for basically to establish a key contact person or persons that uh, whenever we've got any announcements or any information that we'd like to share back and forth that we know who that contact is. And then the second ask is that resource uh, assistance to both improve the trail quality and bring more people into Whitney. Um, that can be financial, that can be other things which are open for discussion. We're not really sure what resources are available, but basically we're looking for what assistance we can get from the township. Can I ask a question there, Lucas, please? It's Sandra Collins here, chair of the meeting. Have you approached the um, South Algonquin Business Association and the various businesses that actually benefit from snowmobiling if they are prepared to contribute anything towards that cost as well? Well, that's something that in the past week, my vice president has been working on because I'm not there all the time. I'm actually from Toronto. 
I spend all my free time up there, all my weekends up there. And when I heard that this club was collapsing, that's why I stepped up because I didn't want to see my trail system disappear. And so my VP's there all the time. He's been actually starting to talk to some people in the area. He spoke with the Mad Musher, I think, yesterday or the day before. And he's working his way around. We're going to be definitely making some more contacts. But I've had limited time here. A lot of clubs have been established for a long time they've had their presidents vice presidents everyone lined up i've had this thrown in my lap five six weeks ago so i've had a lot of documentation to go through other things to set up rather than being able to just go out and uh set up better connections with local businesses and business associations okay thank you for that i mean uh, um with, with regards with with regards to helping with grooming, et cetera, et cetera. The, the club lost a lot of very potential groomers because of them wanting to do a 14 hour stint of grooming and no one was prepared or the older members were not prepared to do that. Um, I, I think you will get more people um, prepared to groom if you can split that down into a couple of six hour shifts or something of that nature. Just something to bear in mind moving on, please, Lucas. Thank you. Oh, no, for sure. A hundred percent. I understand that. The biggest issue we have is we currently only have one groomer where certain clubs have two or three groomers to deal with their trail system so they can work those shorter runs out. For us, if you look at that map, we're just above Carson Lake where that sign is, uh, it says B102. So for us to run all the way up and all the way down to Whitney, it's a 12, 13 hour run. And that's just the way it is. There's nothing much we can do about that because we only have one groomer and it has to come back to that key location to get fueled, get serviced and ready for the next guy the next day. So that's just the reality of it. We can't do a lot about that unless we work into a better system and we impress the OFSC and hopefully get another groomer for next year. And then we can look at positioning it closer down to Whitney or even in Whitney somewhere and run it up the B while the other other groomer runs up as well. Okay. Sounds as though you've got your finger on the pulse there. Does anybody Trying. else from, does anybody else from council have any more questions before uh, before we uh, get the ask? <laughs> um, one thing I did want to point out, uh, if I could, is I'm not sure if you guys were aware of the Turtle Hill bypass there. Yes, we are. <laughs> okay. So that is something we're actually currently working on. I didn't realize what it was until we kind of ran into it the other day. I heard about it and then I saw it and it didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> so we're going to be trying to work on that, see if we can get any solid information that they've had actual findings out there. And if not, work on getting the trail back open. And even if they have had findings, we're going to see if we can turn that into a snowmobile only section of trail put up some gates. I'm a welder fabricator. I can put up some nice steel gates there and we'll have it closed during the three months or three seasons that's not uh, involved with snowmobiling and then open it up. So we have a nice clean section of trail. We don't have to do a weird little run up a rocky steep slope. Uh, one other point that uh, if I could uh, mention before we go is um, speaking with Terry this year, Due to our COVID situations and other uh, environments that we're seeing in Ontario, there has been so far to date a record number of sales of trail passes in expecting for the winter season. It's obviously, if you think about it, it's an individual activity. You can stay isolated, um, yet still be in a group, actually, a funny little thing like that. Um, so there, we're actually expecting a phenomenal turnout this year and, and very high usage. Um, one of the things that we obviously feel is a good relationship to have with the municipalities is how is the municipality preparing for potentially an exceptionally large volume of snowmobilers coming through, uh, you know, to get fuel, food, et cetera. Um, what information can you give us to give to our membership to prepare for that as they go along their routes? Um, so that's one of the things we'd like to, to work on and establish with those key contacts that you would provide us. And that being oh. said, snowmobiles, sea dews ATVs this year have been flying off the shelves. I bought a side-by-side -side this year on a Monday. I went on the Friday to pick it up. 
They had 15 in stock. They had zero on Friday. That's that's how everything's been working. Everything's been selling out, selling out, selling out. So yeah, you, snowmobiles are starting the same way. You don't have to preach that to us. We're living it. We've been here all summer while the uh, masses have been coming. Um, so I would just like to speak to that. One of the things that I think we need to work together. So I guess to answer I can answer your first question. Um, your contact will probably be me. Um, I think Carla's been in touch with you about our newsletter that's going out. So if there's information that you, a little tiny blurb um, that, that you want to put in there, I think she's already been in touch with you, Chris, about that. Um, so that's one thing. One of the things that I think we need to work together on is uh, emergency management and the amount of trail between Whitney and Halliburton and Whitney and Barry's Bay, um, where there are no um, or, or limited resources for search and rescue. Um, we are seeing more and more, as you're saying, there's more and more people coming here to ride ATVs and snowmobiles. And what that means to us is people getting hurt, people getting unfortunately killed sometimes. And that means that our fire department is out there uh, managing those things. So I think uh, through you guys, we're hoping to talk to the OFSC a little bit more to really make people understand how far they are from help. Um, and that's, that, you know, that goes along with slowing down and, and riding safe and all of that stuff. But I think that's something as we're preparing for this huge season that we really need to start to talk about. Um, uh, one I thing we, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, one thing we could work on is uh, this year we actually have more emergency response represent, uh, representatives than the club's ever had in the past. We have three and they're placed at different locations. Uh, one thing we could also work on is if anyone in Whitney wanted to volunteer to help out the club, obviously they can volunteer or they could just be an emergency response contact, have a couple people down at that end of our trail system so they can get out there when something happens. They're a lot closer than someone riding all the way down from Barry's Bay. Um, Chair, it's Jane. Could I speak? Please go ahead, uh, Mayor Dumas. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but anyway, Lucas and, and Chris, thank you for coming to the table. Uh, Lucas, you said something that caused uh, rather a bit of alarm to me. Um, if you gate that trail, you will have an uprising that you have never ever realized could happen. And time re in regards to the Turtle Road, and um, I think good they, luck. I, hmm? I think I just want to clarify what he was saying. I think they're not going to close the turtle trail. What he's suggesting is that they try to get opened the stretch of rail bed that is currently closed because they maybe don't nest there in the winter time for snowmobiles and only let snowmobiles oh. through that piece. Oh, is that what you meant, Lucas? Yeah, that's correct. And still have okay. the turtle bypass open for the ATVs in the other three seasons, but okay. just that for snowmobiles in the winter. Cause I, I can't see the harm in us grooming across that in the winter and having snowmobiles go there. But obviously if there are turtles there and they're, they're nesting in the spring, summer, fall, the ATVs going through hunting trucks and stuff like that, it can be an issue. So having that bypass open for those other seasons uh, is an option and we're looking into this. That's excellent. It might That's not be good. this year, but we're trying. That's good. That's great. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> Uh, I would like to make a point, Chair. But please go ahead, uh, Councillor Florent. Uh, the only I'd like to point out that if uh, if you are going to be accessing public money, uh, and I'm not speaking for Council saying that we're going to give you any money, but uh, if you are using public money, I don't think you would be allowed to sole source a job. Uh, the $6,800 to me seems pretty expensive to fix one hill when you think that you could hire a bulldozer for roughly $100 an hour and 10 hours, he could move a mountain, let alone fill a, a washout. Uh, I just think you'd, you'd need more than one price from one contractor. No, 100%. And I think and that's a reason... good idea. Go Sorry. ahead. Um, the reason we're going with this contractor is his whole 
job and all of his jobs that he does, he builds trails. He builds logging trails. He builds ATV trails, snowmobile trails. This is what he does. And this isn't as simple as filling the hill in over again, because that is what has happened in the past. And we're back at the same point again. So our whole point here is to shove a little bit more money into it. He's going to work on re-sloping the hill. It's not as simple as just filling it in. He's going to slope it. He's going to change it, make it wider, add drainage ditches, put culverts in to try and redirect all that water that is a constant problem and causing the constant washouts. We're looking at doing a little bit bigger in the beginning so we don't have to keep maintaining it every year or two. Yeah, I understand that, but I still think $6,800 is a lot of money. When I used to build roads in the bush too, and of course it was 20 years ago, but we used to build a kilometer of road for $7,000, so just to give you an idea of what things cost. Oh, one more comment from me, Chair. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, Lucas, thank you very much for stepping up and, and for working with Chris to, to maintain, you know, your organization in our area. I think the big uh, issue in the room, another big issue in the room is how much money is not coming into South Algonquin for, you know, from, from um, the OFSC. And, you know, you, we've got, as you say, people that come here, thousands of people, and there's got to be a change in, in the way that money is distributed. I think the money should follow the usage of trails by these individuals. And how do we, you know, we're going to the taxpayers of South Algonquin, which is a very small community. We're in an old COVID situation. Money is tight. We've had individuals that haven't worked this year, seasonal workers. And we've got people coming into town with the top, you know, it's high top end machinery, trailers and machines. And you're asking the taxpayers of South Algonquin to put $6,800 out there. It's not right. And like, how do you plan to approach that in the future? Because, uh, you know, as I say, we've got people that have not worked this summer yet because they are seasonal workers. And, and I have great angst about going to them. And yes, I know these individuals come into town, but the meal that they buy in town isn't going to replace the tax dollars that those individuals have put forward. So how are we going to fix this inequitable situation? No, I understand that completely. And I'm not, I'm not asking you for $6,800. I'm just showing you what it's going to cost to fix that hill that's in that area. And if any contribution can be made, we're obviously going to, we're, we're going to love it. We're going to accept it. And we're going to put as hard work as we can into it. Right. Um, it might not even be fixing that Whitney Hill. I don't know if the township has a grader and you can run down this, some of the rail bed and grade some of it for us or brush it for us. There's, there's other options we can go for here. I was just showing that this is our project in the area and I wanted to make it aware to you that this is what's going on and this is what it's going to You are using the computer audio, it says. <laughs> Poor Richard. So when I hit it, uh, you Richard, we can hear you. Can you mute yourself, please, while you sort it out? Oh, please continue, Lucas. Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, this was just me showing you that this is one project that we have locally in the area right now. And I know it's been an issue in the past and that's why I wanted to bring it up and show you what it's, what it's gonna cost to actually get it done properly. And that's all I was asking. I wasn't asking for the full 6,800 because I do understand that Whitney is a small community and that's a lot of money to dish out. But I was just showing that that's what it's gonna cost. And also there's other options if the township could help out with us. Like I said, grading the rail bed, doing some brushing, anything can help really because we're limited and we have 168 okay, so kilometers of trail okay. to deal with. Oh, they might have... Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for the information. My thoughts are you really should be approaching the businesses that are gonna benefit from this as well as us. Um, and I think that really ought to be your first port of call. And uh, we as a council will discuss whether or not we can maybe add some services, if not finance, um, to the. Obviously, we will discuss that and see what council thinks about it. 
but thank you for the delegation and the information and look forward to a, a very successful snowmobile season this year. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's move on um, with, with our agenda here uh, and maybe discuss um, what we can do to help the club a little bit later on. Um, does anybody have, or do we have any unfinished business? I don't believe we do. Okay, to move on to new business. And I understand, Mayor Dumas, you have some verbal updates on three issues for us, linked to obviously to health and uh, long-term care. Can I hand over to you, please, Mayor Dumas? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you see me? I, I haven't got my, um, you don't need yes. to see me. <laughs> anyway, you don't need to see me. Um, I, I would like I to update see. you. Pardon? We're okay. I said we can see. Okay, thank you. Um, I've asked Holly to put up slides. I'm going to talk about Castle Home initially. And um, this summer, uh, towards the end of August, I received an invite, Holly and I received an invitation to attend um, an update meeting at Castle Home in regards to the redevelopment of Castle Home. And uh, Holly was on vacation at the time, so I attended. Uh, the meeting of virtual a zoom meeting on september 2nd with castle home uh, uh, prior to that meeting i had to sign a confidentiality agreement because it was an in-camera session and it was discussing some processes that were happening with castle home as they go forward with their redevelopment and um, the the acquisition of funds so <clears throat> excuse me so basically the meeting was to to deal with uh to show to the committee members that uh castle home the organization had had uh and had uh, followed their due diligence to get a financer what they were looking at was going to the market to obtain financing for this redevelopment project at castle home they had received or they have received $55.5 million from the ministry towards the redevelopment. And they were going out for a loan for the remainder to make up the $80,000 that the redevelopment of Castle Home is going to cost. And so, <clears throat> as I said, they, they demonstrated how they had gone to tender for the finances. They went to the traditional organi organizations such as banks. They also went to uh, other organizations that that uh, participated that participated in this type of financing, and uh, in the end, they made a recommendation. Um, what I'm going to mention now has has now um, been uh, put forward on their website. What you have on the screen right now are pictures of the redevelopment of Castle Home. And uh, it, it's going to be a very beautiful place when it's finished. This this uh, home was built in built in 1962. I'll be talking about Valley Manor a bit later, and it was built, I believe, in 1969. So you can imagine, and I'm sure if you've been in in uh, not maybe not necessarily Castle Home, but Valley Manor, we all know that uh, what was what was standard of care in 1969 certainly isn't in 2020. So. Um, uh, so Castle Home, after the due diligence and the, do, do, their due diligence and research on financial organizations, in the end made the recommendation, and this is public knowledge at this point, that they are going with Infrastructure Canada or Infrastructure Ontario. I'm sorry for the financing. Um, I think at the end of the at, at the end of the during the presentation, it was it was uh, they were showing on the screen. Um, what each municipality had to contribute in regards to the capital project of the $80 million. And um, South Algonquin as, was at the bottom of the screen and it was covered by the picture of the presenter who was making the presentation. And, and the good news is that we are not included in this project whatsoever of the redevelopment. So our advocacy that we have carried out to this point has ensured that we are not at all involved financially in the redevelopment of the Castle Home project. Um, coincidentally, at the same time as I was working through this, signing the confidentiality agreement, et cetera, 
I had received an email prior, about a week prior to that, in regards to an announcement that was going to happen the next day, September the 3rd at Valley Manor, and that was confidential as well. And uh, so the next day I went to Valley Manor where uh, the Minister of, Law of Long-Term Care, Minister Fullerton, Minister Yakabuski was there. And the announcement was made that, um, that uh, Valley Manor was, uh, had been approved for their next steps in their redevelopment. And um, that, um, let me see, yes, they were getting the new, I'll talk about the new long-term care model, but they got $4.3 million. Also at that, all the local mayors were invited to that, that's, that uh, event at Valley Manor. And it was held in the central area of Valley Manor, if you're familiar with it. It was a lovely day. We were all able to social distance. There were members, there were resident members of present, uh, as I say, the four mayors, um, Minister Yakabuski, Minister Fullerton, all the board members of Valley Manor that were available and um, staff were there. And we, we were uh, screened as we went in, we were screened as we went out. And uh, it was a very interesting and uh, very promising announcement for Valley Manor. Uh, this first picture that Holly's showing you shows the new, new location of Valley Manor in regards to this in the front is a hospital, the white building to the side is the, uh, the clinic building and Valley Manor is further down that street at the back. Uh, if you have time to go on, on the websites, I would encourage you to do so. You will see that Valley Manor is built like a pod. Um, this, sorry, this is showing the location in regards to the hospital. And then um, it, Valley Manor is built like two pods. And again, they're building these homes to current standards and certainly to current infection control standards. And um, um, so that the pod idea for Valley Manor is good because should, could there be a breakdown, they can, they can actually isolate areas of their um, new build. Uh, I'd like to just share some information that they have on their website and um, I know I'm going to be reading to you, but I think it's important. And because this is a, um, you know, being on, on the, our YouTube channel, I think the more we can get the word out about Valley Manor's redevelopment, the better it will be. And, and our, our ask of the Ministry of um, Health, Long-Term Care that we be a supporter of Valley Manor. Um, I think when you think of our residents in our community, the majority of our seniors and their families have chosen Valley Manor as the long-term care facility that they would like to go to. And I think that speaks to us as a council and has for some time when we decided that we were going to exit our, try to exit our agreement with, um, with uh, Castle Home and to bring the funds back to the community where our, our citizens and our seniors have chosen to go for their long-term care. And I know we have other residents that, that do not go to Valley Manor, but certainly the majority of our residents do go there. And if, if council members and staff remember when the, um, the foundation came to us uh, with their new capital, capital equate, sorry, their capital campaign, they are campaigning for the rebuild of Valley Manor and the St. Francis Valley Healthcare Foundation, if you remember, showed us the map. And Holly, you've got the map almost there. It shows when they came to us, they showed uh, Valley Manor and we on the map, the black dot is Valley Manor. So that's where long-term care is happening in this geographical area. And along the, uh, you know, the, the uh, west or the east side of the, the area are the homes that are in Deep River, Pembroke, um, Renfrew, the, that end. So the distance for long-term care for residents in Barry's Bay is significant. And then when the foundation was visiting us, they had the arrow going from the black dot across the park to North Bay, where our actual home that we were designated to, to support financially was located. So the graphics were very good. And um, certainly the board at Valley Manor has used the, the fact that South Algonquin is a Northern community and that uh, uh, they are serving the residents of a Northern community in their location at Barry's Bay. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, so the, I'm going to read and just bear with me, but the new long-term care model for Valley Manor, Manor is such a game changer. It jumpstarts the Valley Manor redevelopment project, which is actually a new build. And that's the other thing. A castle home is a redevelopment of an existing building. And at that meeting I attended the night before the session at Valley Manor, they were saying that how 
how much that is adding into their process. For example, they have put out the tender now. So when the companies come that want to bid on the tender, they have to go through the building and uh, with all the COVID-19 constrictions in place. And I remember working in Barry's Bay at the hospital when we were going processes like this, and you would have groups of five or six or even more people with blueprints, et cetera, coming through the area and, you know, looking into nooks and crannies. So now add the restrictions of COVID to that process. And you can see where there's a possibility um, for cost and, and, you know, maybe cost increases or not, but it certainly is a different uh, process than it was, you know, prior to COVID. So, um, the new funding model, there is also a new funding model for long-term care, and uh, this is the statement from the Valley Manor uh, website. The new funding model is extremely beneficial for Valley Manor's development project as there is new funding there is a new funding model based on the demographics of the home and it moves away from a one size fits all approach. So this makes Barry, Barry's Bay's, our project more complex and challenging, but Barry's Bay is defined as a rural center. And that means they have a core population of less than 10,000 people to, um, you know, to draw their uh, um, seniors from and the uh, process of, of building this new redevelopment as well. So Valley Manor does qualify for a grant based on the percentage of total project costs. This grant will provide up to upfront, uh, will be provided up front to expedite the redevelopment process. Additionally, Valley Manor is constructing a new home based on 60% basic rooms and 40% private rooms. This will meet the needs of the community that it serves. And the ministry will be providing increased funding for the increased basic room percentages. So they feel the board and the staff and administration at Valley Manor feel that the new funding announcement is a victory for Valley Manor and the next step to sit down with Infrastructure Ontario to review the new numbers and work through the Infrastructure Ontario long-term care plan. So there you see the, also that uh, Valley Manor is using on Infrastructure Ontario for their loan process as well. Um, so after the presentations, we had the opportunity, uh, anyone that was there had the opportunity to approach uh, Minister Fullerton and Minister Yakabuski to have a, you know, to thank them and to have a, um, a little chat. I was very fortunate. I had about 10 minutes with Minister Fullerton and Minister Yakabuski. I reminded Minister Fullerton that we had at the Council of South Algonquin had a, sent a letter um, in August of 20, August 24th, 2019 to both the Minister of Health and to her, the Minister of Long-Term Care outlining the process whereby South Algonquin had become um, a supporter of the home in Castle Home. And this is history of long, you know, long years ago. And I thank Holly very much for that letter. It's, it's very comprehensive and it explains our situation as to how it evolved and how we got to where we are today. She, um, Minister Fullerton acknowledged the, the letter and um, she and uh, um, Minister Jacobuski are, are, you know, are very much aware of this process and, and Minister Yakabuski uh, reiterated the fact that he will work with us, with Minister Fullerton, and go forward in the next steps where we want to come up with some type of process where, why, whereby we can uh, support the Valley Manor reconstruction and the long, their long-term care facility there. Um, I think that's all. I, I would stop there if you have any any questions that you would like to ask of me in regards to that. It was a very, it, I felt very good after that that meeting and uh, and uh, as I say, Minister Yakabuski and and I think it's it's fortuitous that uh, um, Minister Fideli, you know, is the individual who's the representative for Castle Home, um, and uh, Minister Yakabuski is is. They are, they are all colleagues in the in you know in the legislature and Minister Fullerton as well. Is there anything anyone would like to ask of me on that? No. Okay. The next item I'd like to update you on is um, the Madawaska Valley Physician Recruitment and Retention Committee. <clears throat> um, we are still in existence. Um, we have been without a recruiter since uh, the beginning of this year. And uh, we were just going to start looking for a recruiter and then COVID hit. So we, we, we tabled that uh, process. And although, and um, 
recruitment has been ongoing in that uh, absence of a recruiter. Uh, we are at the point now, I don't know, maybe some of you are um, patients of Dr. Atfield. Dr. Atfield has uh, two doctors coming into his um, practice to take over. They are doing one full-time equivalent of a position. These are doctors Daniel and Teresa Ostapowitz. They have been in Barry's Bay for a while working in the eMERGE department, etc. They approached the Physician Recruitment and Retention Committee and we have sponsored them. Uh, we are in the process of working through that and there will be announcement and a, a contract signing probably before the end of October. So that means that doctors at Fields practice will continue. There will not be a gap in service for the, uh, the individuals that are um, members of Dr. Atfield's practice. Um, we have, we are working with another uh, individual and possibly another. So that means that um, the other process that the committee is, is, is looking at is the fact that we put money into physician recruitment every year and it is the feeling of the, your representatives on that committee that physician recruitment is not a municipal responsibility. It is, it is um, the need for primary care physicians is, is huge in Ontario, in Canada. And uh, we feel that we have to put that back in the lap of the Ministry of Health. And the Ministry of Health is working very closely with primary care, with all physicians, but certainly uh, physicians in rural and, and, and um, northern areas are, are hard to come by. And there is a group now of primary care physicians for um, Renfrew County, and that includes um, all of the, it includes Deep River, Pembroke, uh, all the primary care physicians, rural primary care physicians in the Renfrew County. It also includes South Algonquin in there so that uh, they are meeting, they are advocating to the Ministry of Health for changes through, through the payment, the fee schedule to, to make sure that primary care anywhere in Ontario is attractive but certainly uh, financial compensation and support to, to recognize the role and the importance of primary care in our area. And as you are aware, uh, the diversity of family health teams in our area is, is, um, is transitioning from, from you know, one physician in an office. We now have nurse practitioners. We now have the family health organization in Barry's Bay has mental health workers, social workers, dietitians. Uh, we are going to a multi-member, multi-team model of healthcare, and, and uh, the, the other component that COVID has added into that situation now is the electronic, uh, you know, the electronic handling of healthcare as well. And um, was there anything else I wanted to say to that? So, what I'm saying to you is that our our committee has. Um, Right now, our committee has, I think, we're, we're doing the books. We have about 300, over $300,000 in, in our kitty as the, as the committee group. And I think if we go through and, and are able to attract these next two committee, these next two physicians, that money will be taken care of. And I think the recommendation may be coming back to our local can councils that we disband this physician recruitment and retention committee and work, um, you know, work at the at the provincial and the regional level to ensure that uh, compensation is is adequate. And that is is somewhat the feeling of the primary care physician group as well. The other part of the primary physician care group is they actually do have a physician recruiter position in in their um, that works with that primary care group. So what we are looking at, uh, the physician recruitment group has looked at joining and using that recruiter. And uh, we had a meeting and we passed that resolution that we would now utilize, this, utilize the services of the recruiter, who is the member of the rural physician, the, the local rural physician primary care group. And um, you may know the individual, uh, Debbie Robinson is the recruiter. She is a, the, the Reeve of Laurentian Valley and she is a current um, um, war, uh, warden for Renfrew County, but she has had this position prior becoming the warden and she's, she does a great job. The other thing with COVID is uh, this, you know, the, the municipalities put in about $134,000 a year. And when we had a recruiter, we were spending out of the hundred and thirty four thousand dollars a year we were we were we were spending at least fifty thousand dollars on the recruiter and the fees to go to the recruitment fairs they're very expensive they were you know they and 
involve travel, they involve, you know, uh, being away, they were, they were very beneficial. But what, hap what will happen, and of course, there's no recruitment fairs happening at this time due to COVID, but should we get out of COVID, uh, then the recruiter for, the, for, uh, for us would be Debbie Robinson, and she would represent all areas. So um, I think that's what I would want to say on that. Are there any questions in regards to that? If you think of any later, feel free to get in touch with me and... and um, I would be happy to answer, answer any questions that you have. One other thing that happened uh, during the summer was that um, the Right Honourable Elizabeth Dowsdale, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, has last year had held um, a Women's Mayor, Mayors of Ontario gathering where she invites individual women's mayor women mayors in Ontario to to meet and to discuss issues um, you know that are happening in their in their municipalities etc so I was invited to attend this session this year and it was very interesting and um, it was good to hear we had representatives from northern Ontario all over Ontario you know not the big of uh, the more rural areas the urban centers um, she does something else I believe with them but this was more the rural the rural areas and there was a speaker there and um, this is going to tie into the um, COVID um, the long-term care long-term effect of COVID-19 and at this session there was a speaker that we had and um, I'm just flipping through my notes here if you would bear with me the session was co-hosted and the session that we were talking about was the impact of COVID-19 on women and it was co-hosted by Armin Yalna Yalna Nazan, who is an economist and is the Atkinson, Atkinson Fellow, and she spoke on the future of workers. And um, I'm sorry you don't have the slides, but I, I'm going to just comment on some of the things that were on the slides. And this was current, and this is current information in regards to the effect of COVID on. Uh, at this point, we're speaking specifically to females in the workplace. And um, it was mentioned that in um, 2008, we had a, a blip in our, in our economics within the province and it was a recession and a recovery. And at that time, the economists that were talking in regards to it, they renamed it, they called it the he session and the he recovery, because the workforce group that were affected by that event at that time were mostly male individuals that were in, um, you know, in in business, etc., and the effect that it had on them at this point in time. So, <clears throat> um, the the top the topic. Uh, her her first slide was called the new abnormal, and it was and and, and instead of saying that there was no growth happening in our economic base at this time, it was called sloth. And she showed a slide that uh, showed the, um, um, the, how the growth um, GDP over the, over the time has gone down significantly and, and you know, that we aren't, don't, we aren't maintaining our, our GDP level. Um, the other new abnormality is that we're, we're not having growth we're not having growth in our economic base. And the other one is the new abnormal is our population aging. So we're not having growth in our, in our industry, our, our GDP, and we have an aging workforce. So that uh, right now, before the pandemic, before the pandemic hit in, a, in Canada, half of the women, half of Canada's employees were women. That was pre this, the pandemic happening. And what's happened since the pandemic, and I think we don't have to look any further than our own community to see what's happened, is um, not just jobs have been lost, but hours of pay, if people are still working, may be decreased. And parents, especially women, mummies, as she referred to them, aren't getting back to work. And we saw that with, um, you know, when schools closed last year in March or April, whenever they, they closed, um, then, you know, women that had had work outside of the home because they were able to work while their children were at school were now at home with their children and and had difficulty or no opportunity to arrange childcare. So um, she, her point was that Canada's GDP 
growth in our GDP depends on mummies and kids achieving maximum potential. And it's, she of course was the fact that uh, we need good childcare, we need established childcare that individuals can affordable childcare. And um, that this pandemic has demonstrated how fragile our system is. And I think each of us can look in our own families, our extended families and know, you know, females and young women in our families that have lost their jobs, uh, you know, because of, of um, they are very, a very visible component of um, accommodation, you know, uh, all our industries, you, you go out, you look, um, you know, hotels, the, the, the staff within the hotels that's largely female in the areas of, um, you know, maintaining the rooms and cleaning, etc. Um, in our stores, cashiers, mostly female, you don't have to look far or talk to, to see or to talk to a member of your families and find someone that's been, a, that's been um, affected by this. Um, so she, indicated, she pointed out that young families with children are the biggest spenders amongst families in, in Ontario, in Canada. And the mothers provide 40% of household income of families with children. So you've got, you know, you've got families, parents that are juggling daycare for the mom to be able to go out to work. And that's 40% of the income that comes into, you know, that comes, um, that goes out into our, our communities to support our grocery stores, our, our, you know, anywhere that they might shop. And so she, at this point, she's saying that there's no recovery right now where we are in this pandemic situation unless we have, do something to help the mummies and the children. And, and, and now they're calling it a she recovery, and, um, and that we have to get uh, we have to help these people. And if we don't, then we're going to be in very dire straits. And um, one more, one more. Household spending is expected to decline 9% this year. I think we are aware of that already happening. Employment in the hospitality industry was only at 79% before COVID. They were already having some pressures on them. And uh, post COVID, it's been cut in half by mid August, and she's it's it will drop again, and we're seeing that already. You know, places that have been able to open, certainly in the in the hot spots, are closing down again. Um, accommodation and food services uh, we're at seventy nine percent are are we're at seventy nine percent level in February, and they've decreased significantly as of August twenty twenty. The large, most large and on online re retailers are okay, but small ones, as she said, are cooked. Most um, our small stores are, are, I think, are you know, are are tenuous in their in their longevity in this situation. And she's saying that a third of small businesses are facing closure. And she was talking to municipal representatives, so she said to us, you know, how is that affecting your main street? Street? How is that affecting your community? And uh, she predicts that she's indicating that municipalities should hold tight. Don't go out and, you know, don't start big projects. Sit where you are with your money, with our money, do our due diligence to our community and to our basic services. And she's predicting that there will be pressures on municipal finances because uh, our money comes from our taxpayers. Uh, situations are tenuous and um, she certainly is is saying exercise caution in your planning for upcoming you know years of budgeting the other thing that she mentioned and has been discussed is the effect on workers um, you know we see the effects out in our community in our family I think we see the effects in our in our in our township with our staff I mean, look at where we are today. We have, you know, we are doing this meeting by Zoom. Our staff, our, our, our administrative staff have had to step up to the plate, learn all these new technologies, support us as counselors through this process. Um, you know, have, have this, there have been benefits. The fact that our, our meetings are by ZooTube and on, or by Zoom, I'm sorry, and on YouTube is, is a good thing. But think of the processes and we as counselors, I mean, I, I have to admit this has not been easy for me. I miss the contact in the room around the council table. However, that's not going to change in the near future. Our works department staff, you know, they have those restrictions 
uh, when, you know, with COVID of traveling together, working together, um, the, you know, the, the, the uh, maintenance that had to be done in our, our, our facilities, our outdoor washroom facilities through the summer. I think our staff have been ex exceptional in what they have done with that in conditions which are at times, as we've noted in other meetings, have been horrendous to enter some of those places and to do that work. So the next thing she mentioned was watch your staff, watch your community, watch your staff, and this can have long-term effects on individuals. And I don't know, I, I, I feel it myself. Um, I, I feel it, I, you know, the isolation. I mean, the isolation from other people. We are, we are um, social creatures. We enjoy interacting and um, just to, to, do, to do our due diligence, as I say, to our basic, to our core services and be cognizant of the fact that this is pressure on everyone and, um, you know, we have maintained our services, we have continued, we, you know, we are now doing our meetings, you know, we have our committee adjustment going forward, we are supporting our community in those processes that we have to, but as a council, we have a responsibility to our staff and to our constituents and to um, just be aware of the long-term concerns that may be coming out of this. And I, you know, I don't think we're going to be out of this in the near future, perhaps in the longer term. I don't know if there are any questions in regards to that. It was hey. a busy, sorry. Uh, Chair, is it okay if I just say something? Yes. Oh, I'm not um, the chair, I'm sorry, dear Joy. No, no, I know, I know Sandra's the chair, but I'm uh, just asking her. Please, please go ahead. Um, I don't know if everybody's aware, but um, We've had a very good run in uh, this area here of uh, negative cases, but now we have positive cases of COVID in the area. And I think it was inevitable that this was gonna happen, but uh, just as long as everybody's aware that there has been at least two positive uh, cases of COVID within the Barry's Bay region. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Councillor Vermeer. We have been very, very fortunate. And uh, as, a, as a, you know, as the, uh, our member, our council member sitting on the Renfrew County District Board of Health, um, they have done a phenomenal job. And you're right, it's inevitable, um, you know, considering the amount of traffic that has been going through our township all these past months, um, we have done very, very well. But um, it's, it's, we were doing well and we still are doing well. So that's all I have to say. I thank you. As I say, it's been a busy summer and um, uh, good things happening. I'm, I'm delighted about Castle Home. I think um, I, I thank council, I thank staff. When we set down this road, they told us that it would never, you know, that it wouldn't, it would not happen, that we would be released from Castle Home. Uh, we are still paying our levy there, but that will, you know, I hope we will work hard with Minister Yakabuski and Minister Fullerton to, to get that uh, process, as, process completed and have the dialogue as to how and what will be acceptable um, uh, support of the Valley Manor as they go through the redevelopment and for the future as well. In my mind, I'm seeing how can we help them with the redevelopment process and then how can we support them through the, the next years as well. So that will be something new and uh, there are changes happening in long-term care. So I, I am confident that this will happen as well. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you, Mayor Dumas. Very, very informative and uh, all very positive. So thank you for that. Um, next point on our agenda is over to you. Um, Holly, with regards to the long-term effect of COVID, which Jane has broached on slightly but I think you have some more and there are some um, gender items added um, I'll hand that over to you please Holly thank you yeah I really just want to uh, quickly discuss uh, you know further to what Jane was saying um, I think as as we've all said we're all being affected by it mentally emotionally um, I think people are people are exhausted and um as we, we are, the next steps that staff are taking is to move into um, 
budgeting or we're moving into our 2021 budget. Um, there's been some discussion about um, operations versus capital and uh, it's been voiced that the capital work that we've been doing is taking away from operations. Um, some of the, the work that we're doing with the municipal modernization I think is going to speak to that and maybe the way forward as far as um, how we should be doing capital. but. It's going to be my recommendation uh, in the face of COVID that we back off our capital projects in 2021. Um, there's some things that we need to do as far as asset management planning and developing policy and that kind of thing. We have a couple um, parking lots, um, a, uh, cottage area, parking areas that we've been talking about. I think that's something that we should clean up really well in 2021, um, some outhouses. But I think uh, other than that, we should back away from uh, taking on any large projects um, as it is, you know, it is a huge staff resource. We do all of that stuff in house with the exception of the asphalt. Um, so that's my recommendation. We will have a budget meeting coming up, but I just wanted to kind of put that bug in council's ear. Um, Further to that, we do have a um, an economic intern uh, internship that, as you all know, was was um, approved early last year, and we went through the process, and and we're not successful in hiring someone. Um, right now, I'm in a situation where I have moved uh, all staff, with the exception of Carla and Tracy away from each other into separate rooms, and this is to um, impede having to wear masks all day every day so we've have uh, the CBO is now working out of our kitchen and the um, fire chief is working in the council chambers so um, really we physically have no space for another staff here right now unless we do some type of construction project to make another office um, there is a potential that we could um, we could go out and hire someone and have them work off-site um, I think in, you know, in COVID situations, hiring a new staff is going to be difficult for the staff that are here. We just went through it with the fire chief and um, it is not as comfortable as just having someone start, you know, as they would have before COVID. So I wanted to get a little bit of uh, input on that. I don't know if you guys want to comment on the internship. The other part of that, I guess, is what we were hoping to accomplish with them was a uh, business retention expansion um, assessment, which really involves getting out into the community and talking to the existing businesses, as well as figuring out you know, how to get some new ones here. So I'll kind of open the floor to council if you wanted to give me some feedback on that position. No. Chair, if I could go ahead. Go ahead, Councillor Bonga. Sure thing. Um, I personally am am uh, completely fine with a uh, with a remote worker. Uh, the way I look at it is, uh, this is a um, it, it's money provided through a grant uh, for for an additional. Uh, staff member, and uh, I see that as an asset. Uh, even if this person does work remotely, uh, I, I think that the township uh, could use a lot more of a digital footprint online. Um, and there's a lot of work that can be done online and remotely. Um, so, so I don't really see a. Um, and and Holly, as you pointed out very correctly, um, there just isn't enough space to accommodate another physical person, um, and. Uh, that's the way that I would be comfortable approaching it. Uh, and uh, that's, and, and I'll cut myself off there. Thank you, Councillor Bongo. Does anyone else have anything more to add to that? I, I mean, I am totally in agreement with um, a remote working person as well, someone comfortable with online presence and uh, Zoom meetings, I, I think would be almost a criteria for for the, the person employed. So I totally agree with you there. Councillor Harper, you uh, wish to say something? Yes, uh, just a comment. Um, I agree partially with Bongo's interpretation of this. How much training is gonna be required for this interim? Um, I would think it would be very difficult to train somebody at, from the start on 
over or outside our office environment. Um, to do it online, to try to train somebody online who hasn't got any experience in the past would be very difficult. Uh, again, I agree partially with Bongo. It would be nice to have people, but for the training aspect of it, um, I would find it, maybe Holly would have a difficult time trying to train somebody in that, in that respect. That's it. If I may, Chair. Yes, please go ahead. I think this is one of the things that I was alluding to your, you know, um, I think it's important, but it, you know, is this going to put another pressure on Holly? Because, you know, if it's remote, then, you know, how, how is that going to happen? How are they going to meet with people? Does that mean Holly, I guess I'm, I'm agreeing somewhat with Councillor Harper. I would think this person, whomever we had would have some skill, would have skills but I don't want that to be that Holly then has to be the person that is, is doing the majority of work for the, for the supporting of the individuals. I have to, I think it's important to our community. I really do. But again, where is the workload going to happen and, and, and how? And um, I just think we have to be cognizant of, of what it's doing with our staff. If you got someone, if that money, and I don't know, Holly, if the, the grant amount is, is significant enough to actually hire someone who has done this previously. You know, we had talked, it's, a, it's an internship. So I'm assuming that it's someone that has not done this in the past on their own as a professional. They are coming out to get experience to do this in, okay. in a municipal environment. Yeah, and, and so it's interesting that you bring that up because, um, one of the struggles that I'm having is the the grant does require that we hire someone who's fairly fresh out of school, um, which was kind of one of the issues with the first round is, you know, have, finding someone who wants to live here permanently um, for a one year contract is difficult. So I've talked, you know, to neighboring municipalities, Lake of Bays started seven years ago, um, they hired someone to, in, in an interim position, that person is still there and doing some good things. Um, that that's kind of echoes throughout um, all of the, the success stories that I've heard where they started with this and continued to, to grow it. Um, I'll be honest, putting effort, having just gone through it with the fire chief, um, you know, putting effort into bringing a new staff up to speed when you know that it's going to take the workload off of you indefinitely is it is a great thing like I feel like we're making strides there and we're seeing progress and it's it's going in the direction that we want it to um no doing that same thing knowing that it's a 12-month placement and it's very unlikely that it's going to be you know at the end of that 12 months I'm going to be looking for a solution or I'm going to have a report that says we need to do a bunch of other things um I'm a little hesitant in COVID to do that um I can have a conversation um, with the person who's providing the grant and see if she has advice. Um, I don't know. I, again, I'm not really sure. I'm kind of torn on this situation. <laughs> so um, I guess I can do that. I can, I can go back to um, the federal funder and, and talk to them and then maybe bring you guys a staff report. That's suitable. I, I think that yep. would be the way forward, um, Holly. And can we ask that you do that? Thank you. Um, Councillor Bongo, you wish to say something? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, from the perspective of a, of a manager or a staff person like Hugh Hawley, I, I totally see how, um, yes, there is a bit more of an added time commitment because there is a new person and they do need some level of training. Um, Although at the end of the day, I think the whole, I don't know, I, I feel like this is being presented as a, um, uh, almost like a liability, like a, uh, like a time management liability, an extra person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do get that in that training stage. But I think as, as a human resources unit, I think we have to look at this, okay, so, so, so we hire a new person and then we need to turn this person into a, um, 
uh, ultimately you need to make them productive. Uh, and I know that staff, uh, especially you, Holly, are short on time. Um, so for us to look at this in such a way so that this person will actually relieve um, time. Um, and, you know, social media to me is, is something that we can really improve in. And you, you're correct, the, uh, the, the business retention uh, program, that would be uh, definitely one of the number one things on the priority list of this person to accomplish. Uh, but from my perspective as the economic development chair, if this person spent 40 hours a week strictly on social media, never walked into the office, I think that would be just a, an, a phenomenal use of our time and resources. If, we were, if South Algonquin was tweeting and Instagramming and Facebooking every single day, um, uh, even if they are announcements that are related to other subjects like health or infrastructure improvements or things like that, even if, if, if South Algonquin is constantly every day pumping social media messages on all of the channels uh, and that doesn't take, uh, and that theoretically shouldn't really take away any, any time or resources from you or other staff members, um, then I think that that is a step in economic development, even though it's totally online. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Does anybody else have any, any input to, to the position being re-advertised? Okay, Holly, go back to um, the initial. So um, the other item that I wanted to discuss is um, as we move forward, <clears throat> excuse me, into the 2021 budget, um, we are slated to do an, an update to our strategic plan in 2021. Um, so I want to be really clear about uh, that project. And if council is supporting the need for an update to our... Sorry, I, I personally lost your... Your voice then, Holly. Oh. Could you repeat so, the last? So in 2016, we did a strategic plan that we said we were going to update every four years. So 2021 is that year. Um, and as we're moving into the budgeting, um, so I personally, that strategic plan uh, was cumbersome. It was very large. It had a lot of objectives. So we uh, if you'll recall, at the beginning of this council uh, term, I scoped it down and we kind of tried to focus on a few things. Um, so as of 2021, we should be doing an update um, and rescoping our strategic plan. So I think that kind of goes along with the, the conversation we just had about the economic development intern. Um, we need to decide what our strategic priorities are and uh, clearly articulate them. So I just want to have that conversation with council and make sure that all council is on board with a strategic planning session and update in 2021 and that we should be budgeting for that. Okay, thank you. And we, we can put that as an so, agenda item on a council meeting. Do you want me just to put a, a resolution on the table to say yes, we'll strategic plan or no, we're not doing it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, please. Um, okay. Um, Along with that, as we have in the last two years at the November council meeting, we'll be voting on a, there'll be a staff report for the um, cost of living increase for the, um, for the grid. Um, and then um, further to that uh, COVID conversation is Halloween. Um, there are other municipalities, our neighboring municipalities who are doing special um, locations and programs and what have you. <clears throat> My recommendation is that we just put in the newsletter, um, there's, a, there's a poster that the provincial government has put out that says wear your mask and social distance. And if you aren't interested in providing candy, keep your lights out. Um, so I think that from a municipal standpoint people are looking for us to make a comment i would suggest that that should be the our recommendation but i would like for council to let me know if you agree with that 
Does everybody agree with, with that stance for Halloween? It doesn't affect us at this end of the town or this end of the township. Nobody tends to, uh, to, to, to come to our doors. We're, we're too distant mainly. I'm not sure, maybe in the center of Madawaska, maybe a little bit more um, affected. But if we take the provincial stance, then we're not doing anything wrong, are we? No. Okay. okay, so we'll put that in the newsletter. Um, and the last, I'd, oh. I, have a, I have a comment. Please go seeing ahead. It's Halloween, seeing it's Halloween, everybody's wearing a mask anyway. That's right. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, so the only other item is, um, as we spoke in the council meeting, uh, the Algonquin of, of sorry, the um, ne negotiating team for the Algonquin land claim has offered to meet with us. Um, I did schedule, try to schedule them for the 29th of October. Um, they came back and let me know that they would be providing all of you members of council. I'm not sure if it'll come through me or straight to you, but they're going to provide a package on the 26th of October. Um, so when we were trying to set schedule the meeting, they didn't feel like you would be able to get through it all um, and, and really read it well before the 29th. So they've come back with the week of November 13th as an opportunity to meet with them. Um, they, specifically, they, they thought the 13th would work. If that will work for most members of council, um, we, we could take that date. And if not um, a day before that, during that week, that is a short week because we have a rem Remembrance Day in the middle, but are most members of council available on the 13th? I am. Um, yep. Is that a hunting season, Joe? <laughs> yes, it is, but it's only one day. And it's Friday. You should one be morning. Anyway, right? <laughs> okay, so I will go with 9 a.m. on the 13th. I'll touch base with Richard on that. Um, and then I will, they will probably send you out a Zoom link. And like I said, um, there'll be a package come to you electronically. Uh, they're telling me around the 26th. So next Monday, um, if I don't hear anything, I will, I'll reach out to them on Monday. Um, I assume I'll get the same package as you guys will. Um, and if there's things that people need printed once they've sent that to us, just let me know and I can create packages. Um, Thank you. So that's all I have. Um, Carla and I are working towards the updated website. So I think she sent a message out to you guys if you have updates that you would like to see, or more, more so if there are things on the old website that you want to see us pull over, please let her know that. Um, and that's all for me. Okay, I think that's we've covered everything that was on our agenda. Before we close, does any does any councillor have anything else they wish to add here? Did you want to discuss the OFSC ask? Oh yes, they are asking obviously for for money, um, which quite rightly, as Mayor Dumas was saying, um, the people in South Algonquin shouldn't be footing the bill for all of this, but Many people in South Algonquin are employed in the businesses in South Algonquin that will benefit from snowmobile trade. Um, I think we should be helping in some way, shape or form, but whether or not this is a council, a municipality help, or whether this should be businesses, um, I'll throw that open to anybody else's thoughts on this. Does anybody else have anything to contribute towards that? Do you think we should be helping and supporting this club or not? I have a question. Yes, Councillor Bongo, go ahead. Uh, the piece of trail that uh, they uh, want to improve, uh, who technically owns it? That's on Crown Land, Bongo. Okay, so it's Crown Land, okay. Now, I'm assuming we haven't got a large scale map of that area. I, I would take it it's the trail leading out of Whitney down behind McCray's along pretty well parallel to Hay Creek Road up on top of the hill there and it comes down across that Tag Alder Swamp and comes out onto Hay Creek Road. I think that's the hill he's talking about. 
Mm. It is. Curtis, yeah. Curtis Harper, yes. Um, at the back of McRae's there. It, it runs with water. It, uh, Ian nearly killed me in the groomer once taking it out there. Um, so I know exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to prevent any running water by ditching and changing the way that that um, hill copes with the water. Um, so I know it is at the back of McRae's there. You are correct. That's well, exactly what they're talking there was about. Rock. It is rock. That's the issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, well, I'll, my I'll just... Sorry, Councillor Florent, can you go ahead, please? Yes, it's my understanding that that is actually on McRae's property. Some of it is, Joe. There is mm -hmm. a portion of it, yes. And is it is it accurate, Councillor Florent, that that portion that comes down right to Hay Creek Road uh, was created to avoid sleigh riders? It was created it used to come to, uh, to avoid going through McRae's Mill Yard. Right, but but after that, it it used to run down and come out halfway down the slide hill, and they they shut it off brought it out to the road early to avoid that, did they not? I'm not sure. That's a good question, Ollie. The trail used to come out on our slide hill, yes, at one time, but that was a long time ago. When I was a kid. Um, <laughs> I think that they, they redirected it there because there was some concern about kids in snowmobiles and the, the amount of traffic. But, I, and I think now that that section just washes away because the, the water naturally runs there and it's all boulder. Yep. So I don't know um, if you want me to talk to the works department about equipment or if you're only thinking about funding from a dollar value or if there's no interest at all, um, just give me some direction. Derek, can I speak? Please do, please go ahead. So I slid up here. Uh, when I cottaged up here, I uh, before we moved, I bought all my passes through the local club. And I think that's where the drive should actually be um, to do some kind of advertisement. The club should be doing some kind of major advertisement to get the out of towners that are coming in that are sledding here to buy their passes here. Um, I am not in favor in any manner of giving any money to the club for trail maintenance, um, nor any equipment. Uh, this council voted down a private roads grant program where a lot of those roads were on crown land and I don't see any correlation uh, to do the same thing here. I think it's the onus is on the business and the club um, to raise that money. Like I said, I am a sledder here and I feel for them and I'm willing to buy my pass here uh, and volunteer time, but uh, I'm not in favor of using public funds for this matter. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Vermeer. Can you have any, do you have any idea of how we could maybe support with a banner um, or some way to try and get the out of towners buying their passes here? That's the, uh, the issue, isn't it? Hmm. There's thousands, millions of dollars down in clubs down south of Ontario where they don't get any snow and they have bank accounts with millions of dollars in. And uh, up here, we barely have enough money in the clubs to run the fuel for the groomers. Um, it's something the OFC are trying to address, I believe. Um, and it seems that by us having someone living in Toronto, maybe they will have a little bit more of a sway or an understanding of what is happening. But this has been an ongoing issue for many, many, many years. The disparity of where the money is and where the sledders ride doesn't seem to be correct. Um, I have sympathy, but I also agree with you with regards to our tax dollars here in the municipality. Does anybody else have any input there? If I can go ahead. Please do. Sure thing. Uh, I, I echo Councillor Vermeer. Um, I'm very torn because I do see the long-term value in the economic development 
And I do know for a fact that uh, that section of the trail is in uh, bad shape. And uh, I also know that it is deterring people from coming here because of its status. status. Uh, however, um, I'm really looking at it from the lens as, as a few months ago when we were looking at non-municipal roads. Um, and I'm looking at this as a non-municipal road. So um, I'm uh, in the camp being more against uh, publicly funding this. Uh, however, I, I, I want to help as much as possible, but, but the issue is, again, what to do with public money for a non-municipal infrastructure. Thank you. I agree. Uh, Chair, it's Jane. May I speak? Please, please go ahead, Jane. I agree. I, I, I express myself and I don't want, I really don't see municipal dollars going for this, but I'm thinking, you know, we need to get the message out and, and um, that, that as you know, Councillor Vermeer and Councillor Vongo have indicated that, that people coming to SLED here should be purchasing their trail pass here. And I'm, I'm wondering, Holly, when we get our new website up, I mean, most people, if you're going somewhere new, they're going to check a website somewhere along the way. And if we had banners across there all the time, like starting this time of year or even in the, you know, in October and telling, reminding, you know, like a banner that would go across of our website saying, buy your trail pass in wherever you buy them for South Algonquin, you know, support sledding in this area or whatever, so that similar to your banner that you su suggested, Sandra, but like a virtual banner out there that's sort of on everything that we do and um, you know even on even on our notice boards now that are in each one of our, our communities if there isn't an event on it why don't we have that up there now you know buy local buy your sled pass and support sledding in South Algonquin some kind of message like that to get out there but again I agree I, I don't feel taxpayer dollars should be redirected into this there's as you say Sandra there's very much money in account somewhere in regards to sledding in Ontario. Maybe it's the role of our businesses to send out to all of their people that they have on their databases to remind them to do just that. Um, and I know online bookings and, uh, and various things happen with our businesses. So they have data they could be sending out um, to all of their clientele please, if you're going to buy a snowmobile pass, remember to buy it here. I, I think a lot of the onus has to go to the businesses here and not to the township. That, that's my thoughts. And Holly, if I, please. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. So one of my character flaws is, is that I always want to fix the problem. And I feel like going into I, I think that council should write a letter to the OFSC and say why are, why are you continuing to promote a broken system if there are people in Guelph who don't get snow driving here every year year after year after year and we're telling those people in Guelph to buy passes here why can't the provincial wide system figure out how to manage their money right why don't we send them a letter and say we have thousands of people come through this community and use these trails why is there not more money here? And see if they'll answer us. Because I don't think that people should have to decide. We spend most of our time in Cochrane riding. We buy passes here because we know no one buys passes here. Why doesn't the entity that manages that manage it? So my recommendation is that we send them a letter and ask for a response. I agree, Holly. Good idea. I think that that, I think that, that would be seen as helping the Opiongo snowbirds. I, I think that that is seen very much as a very positive way of us trying mm. to help as a township, but putting a letter together to the OFSC, I think is an excellent idea. Perfect. Can I say something? Please go ahead. Uh, it's my belief that you can't actually buy a permit anymore at a local store. You have to buy them online. Is that not correct? That is correct, yes. So how could you buy locally if it's online? You tell, when, when you buy your permit, you tell them where you ride. Okay. So that's, it doesn't make sense because like I said, we, we live here, we ride there. Should our money go to Cochrane? They don't need more money. So, and I don't under, yeah. So I think we should ask them why, they, why their system is the way it is and just see if they give us a response. Agreed. Okay, can we direct um, staff to actually put that letter together then, please? Sooner rather than later. 
Thank you. And also CC um, Lucas and, and the team from Oki Opiongo to let them know we're doing that on their behalf. Thank you. Does anybody else have any input here? Okay, I call to adjourn this meeting. It is 10.39. Can I have um, someone propose that please? I will. Okay, I'll Councillor second. Florent I'll and second. seconded Councillor Harper, thank you. And thank you everybody for your time this morning. Thank you. Bye-bye.